make sure that they are doing okay and reach out, but we are finishing up in our series, Vending Machine Faith. And, and we've been talking about a lot of things, but the point of this whole series was to remind us all that, there, that, that we have these experiences. We have these situations that come up in our lives that, that lead to our frustration, and yes, our frustration with God. And so because, because we think that God is sometimes not paying attention to us, right? We think that we're alone. But what we've been talking about for these, these other two weeks is that we're not alone. This is actually quite common. But in, in order for all of us to get on the same page, I want to begin with a question that I, I believe that all of us have asked. And that question is, why doesn't God? Do something about that. And the reality is that you don't have to think very hard to come up with a that, do you? You don't have to really dive into the recesses of, of your mind to come up with a that, that you want God to do something about. Some of you might be sitting next to your that right now. You know, I realize, and that was funny, you're allowed to laugh. Your spouse can't get mad. But, but some of you work with a that. Some of you work for of that. And the problem and the illnesses that we see on TV or that we hear about, we read about the things going on in the world, we can often sit there wondering and saying out loud, why don't you do something about that? God, why? Why does that have to happen? Why do people have to suffer with that? Why do people have to, to fall victim to that? Why won't you do something about that? And we've been talking about in this series that all of us have had these times, if we're honest, we've all had these times where we felt that God was inattentive, uncooperative, and sometimes late. And we've been talking about this thing that those dark moments that we tend to hang on to, right? When our faith is, is, is like the thread of a thread. And we're on the verge and we're looking for something and we're asking those questions and, and sometimes out loud. And we're wondering, can I even believe anymore? Can I continue? Can I trust in God? And so right off the bat, I want to open the Word of God, and I want to jump into John 11.1. 1. And it says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And so this is just a few miles from Jerusalem, okay? We're setting up this backdrop. And in 11.3, it says, So the sisters sent word to Jesus. And so Jesus is about a day and a half's walk away. And so they sent word to Jesus. They knew where he was, and they sent word to him. And what they sent was, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now, how, be honest, how would you like to be the one known as, like, you're not like Bill, you're not, you're not Tom, you're not Susie, you're simply known as the one Jesus loves? Would that be cool or what? These people knew enough that they didn't even have to say his name. They just said, hey, Jesus, the one you love is sick, and he knew who they were talking about. They didn't even have to say his name. And in fact, if, if, if Lazarus would have had a name tag, it would have probably looked like this. Right there, right there, big and bold, right? Jesus loves me. That's it, right? He, he would just put that on and, and probably show off a little bit. But people would say, oh, we know exactly who you are. You're the one that Jesus loves. And we know that, that Jesus loves everybody. But Jesus really, and we're told, he had this special affinity. He had this love for Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And so much that all they had to do was say, Jesus, the dude that you love is sick. And so the story continues in 11.4. It says, when he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. And I think in this moment, Jesus kind of creates a brand new category. Okay, are you ready for this? He says, no, it, and it is the sickness, is for God's glory. And so we scratch our head. It, it is the sickness, and this is for God's glory. So are you saying that sickness is for God's glory? I don't understand that. 
I thought that sickness was a bad thing. I thought nobody wanted to be sick. Sickness was bad, and you're saying it's for God's glory. And he says, no, this sickness is for my glory. And so, so, so that, which is the purpose statement, the that, the quotations around, the thing that we're going to try to fill in the blank today, the that, this purpose statement, is so that God's Son may be glorified through it. And so it being this sickness, Jesus is saying, this is a new that. And this is co- a complete new way of thinking, not probably for us, but especially for them then. Because he's saying that I'm about to give you light in your darkness. I'm about to give you hope where you just don't think there is any hope anymore. And so John, who is writing this story, he realizes that this story is about to take this crazy turn. So before he goes further, he, he tells us what happens next, right? He, he says, John, uh, John actually in this moment gives this kind of line of commentary that doesn't seem to fit what's happening in this interaction with, with Jesus. But here's what John says in, in 11.5. Now, Jesus loved Mar- uh, Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And so we can sit there and say, okay, why are you putting this out there for us, John? Why are you telling us that? And I think it's because he's saying, and he's giving this message to us as we're reading this 2,000 years later. Because we're not going to believe what happens next. When we try to, to put our that's in that situation. When we try to formulate and, and think about how our interactions with the people that we love so much, what we would do. It doesn't seem to fit this story. So in eleven six seven, it says, So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. He stayed. John just told us that Jesus loved them. And even if he didn't love Lazarus, let's just say he didn't, and and John got that wrong. If he loved Martha and Mary, he would surely go to them immediately because they're saying that their brother is sick. And Jesus loved Lazarus and and loved Mary and loved Martha. So why? Why, when Jesus heard this, when he heard that John was this sick, that they're sending messengers, why did Jesus stay there two more days? And so the text continues. And then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. And they they stop and they say, but Rabbi, they said that a a short while ago, the Jews there, they, they tried to stone you. And yet you're going back to them. And the implication here to Jesus is when the Jews try to stone you, sometimes they miss and hit us. Right? So there's an ulterior motive there. Sometimes when they're pitching these, at least one or two of them are going to miss you and possibly hit us. And so we really don't want to go back to Bethany or Judea because the Jews are waiting on you. And so it's, it, it's safe to say that if you're following a guy that's getting stoned, at least one is going to miss its mark. And isn't one too many? Right? Right? Does anybody want to go into that situation knowing that people are going to be pitching stones? I just want to clear the air here. Does everybody get what I'm saying here? Anybody like to be stoned? Anybody like to have rocks thrown at them? We're going to keep, we're going to, we're going to raise the bar here. We're going to, people are really either really attracted to our church, you know, like, oh, I got to go there, or they're repulsed. You know, either way, we're very polarizing here at Cross Connect. But it's safe to say that these guys didn't want to go for that reason. And in John eleven nine, 9, Jesus answered, Are there not 12 hours of daylight? I, I, I'm sorry, Jesus, what? I, I just said I don't want to be stoned. What are you talking about 12 hours in daylight? I don't get what we're talking about. You know, we were just talking about going to, to Judea and getting stoned, at rocks thrown at us. We're clarifying here now. We're getting rocks thrown at us, and we don't want to go. And Jesus says, yeah, but aren't there 12 hours of daylight? And they're probably like, yeah, okay, um, what are we talking about again? 
And so in this moment, I think that this is so brilliant. Jesus gives us this little teaching, right, that they had no idea what he was talking about. And John, you know, he, he's writing this stuff down, and, you know, he's like probably, he's tuning out. He's not understanding, you know, tracking Jesus, and he's trying to pretend to write, right? You know, just, just telling the guys, just, shh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, Jesus, 12 hours, got it, got it, got it, got it. And they're trying to figure out what they're going to do next, right? But they know that Jesus is going to say something important. So, so John is writing some things down. And when you get to the end of this story, when you go back, when we read all of this through, when we cheat and we flip to the end of the story, it becomes evident that what Jesus is saying is what he says here in John eleven nine 9 to 10. Those who walk in the daytime will not stumble, for they will see by this world's light. It is when people walk at night that they stumble, for they have no light. And I don't know that they truly understand it even at this point, right? Maybe still too profound for them, pretending to get it, right? Nobody wants to be the guy that doesn't get it. And, and so this is so important. When Jesus says that there's 12 hours of daylight, what Jesus is talking about there is 12 hours of opportunity. He's talking about the opportunities that we have in that light. In that half a day while the sun is up, there's an opportunity to get things done. But when that sun goes down, we lose some of those opportunities. And what Jesus is saying to them is, is so powerful. He's saying, guys, you can stay right here if you want. You can be so petrified in your own fear that you don't want to move or take a step forward. You can stay here if you want. But I'm not going to be here that long. And so I really need you to learn all that you can. And so if you follow me to Bethany, if you follow me to Judea, I'm going to introduce you to something that you won't learn any other way. So if you trust in me, let's go. And so the text continues in, in chapter 11, verse 11. After he said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. And so the disciples replied because, because they don't want to go, right? And now they're, they're starting to give Jesus medical advice here in, in 12 and 13. It's so funny. He says, his disciples replied, Oh, great, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Right? Just sleep it off. Whatever it is, just sleep it off. Rest is the best medicine. If he sleeps, he'll be fine. So we don't need to go to Judea. Lord, if he's asleep, he's doing fine. And so, so how many of you have given God medical advice? Anybody? Anybody want to admit to that? Anybody want to be that guy or that gal? Right? God, all you have to do is this one thing. God, all you have to do is that. And then, then I'll be great. God, would you make me a little bit taller so I don't need a platform? You know, just something like that. Stretch me out. Yes, Lord, stretch me. I'm not sure that's what he meant. But disciples, you know, concerning Lazarus, they were just worried about getting stoned. Jesus had been speaking about death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. And so Jesus told them plainly in 14 and 15, Lazarus is dead. And he turns to his closest followers. And he says, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there. And this, can you put yourself in this place? What would you think? What would you say? And I would be like, hold on a minute. You knew he was going to die. And Jesus said, yes. You let Mary and Martha nurse their dying brother till he died. And you knew he was going to die. Yes, I did. And you didn't go. And now you're saying you didn't go on purpose. Yes. And you're glad. You're glad that you weren't there to save this guy who you supposedly love so much. And in that moment, Jesus would lean forward in a soft voice and say, yes. Yes. All of that is true. Okay, Jesus, 
I know you're into these big illustrations, right? So what is so important for us to learn here that you would allow the one that you love to just die? And I want you to check this out in 11, 14, and 15, kind of continuing, continuing on. So that, and remember that that is the purpose statement. So that you, so that you, so that you, may believe but let us go to him and so jesus it is so valuable for us to believe in you that you would allow someone to die just to bring us all to this full growth in faith in you and he said yes it's that important to me and this is a brand new category. This is you know, blowing our minds. This is something completely new. And this just messes with a lot of people's theology. Jesus right here created a that so that we could understand what God is doing. When God doesn't do that thing that you think God should or that you think he ought to do or that he doesn't do it when you think he should do it. Does anybody remember Winnie the Pooh? Anybody? My favorite character was Eeyore. Everybody remember Eeyore, the little donkey? Don't, I don't want to hear it. Anyway, I had a little Eeyore, and I, and, and I, and I carried it with me. And, and those of you know, when I was, when I was uh, an infant and had cancer then, completely different situation, but um, I carried it with me everywhere. And so introducing this, this, this character here, I was thinking about what... Um, what they would have sounded like when they were not wanting to go and they're so worried about getting being stoned to death right and i could just hear all of these these characters you know like oh it's going to be so bad you know everything is negative everything is bad and jesus had one of those in his group and just like all of us have one in our families and if they're next to you don't say a word right but but in 11:16 then thomas also known as didymus said to the rest of the disciples, and, and I just picture this, and I get creative, I realize it's creative license, but I picture and I hear Eeyore's voice when I read this, let us go that we may die with him. You know, can, I mean, can, can, do you get that theme? You know, Lazarus is dead, the Jews are going to stone Jesus, right? And now they're going to stone us. It's going to be a massive funeral. You know, let's just go to Jesus, and we'll go to Judea, and we'll die with Lazarus. And, and so what happens in verse 17, it says, On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Four days. Somebody's talking about smelling. Yes, four days. And here's what we, where we need to take a pause, and we need to understand kind of this drama in the moment. Because back in Bethany, you know, Lazarus, he didn't just die. We, we see death, and sometimes we can be so complacent about it and so detached from it. But this guy was dying without pain meds. And, and it doesn't even say that they even knew what he was dying from. So back in Bethany, this, this, this guy is dying. And they send Jesus this message and you can guess how this played out, you know. Mary and Martha are sitting next to Lazarus. You know, they're probably putting a, a rag over his forehead, wiping the sweat off. Right, he's saying, don't worry. It's all going to be okay. We sent for Jesus. We don't have to worry. Jesus is on his way. We got word to Jesus. We got confirmation. They talked to Jesus. They told Jesus, you were sick, so everything is going to be fine. The messenger came back, and he said that he delivered that message that they'll be here. And while they were nursing their brother, they waited. Lazarus waited. And then Lazarus died. The waiting stopped. And all of these people we read about began to mourn. But still, still, no Jesus present. 
And isn't that where we live sometimes? Again, if we're honest, isn't that where we live? Isn't that where we feel, you know, like God can be this inattentive, uncooperative, or even late? But I believe that Jesus created in this moment, in this instance, in this circumstance, he created a that so that we could understand. I believe that he created a that moment so that we could have and carry hope even into our times, into our lives. That's how important this whole lesson was. It was important to our Savior and it was important, it is important to us. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus was already, he had already been in the tomb for four days. And I want to highlight that four days for just a minute because that four days is actually very important because in the first century that they actually believed that the spirit of a person hovered over the body for four days. They believed that this body, that the spirit was hovering over for that three to four days and, and, and they believed that when the face, you know, through that rigor mortis, when the face began to change after three or four days, that the Spirit would leave, like the Spirit would look down at that body and say that there's no hope. I will never be able to re-inhabit that body. And then the Spirit leaves. And the text continues in verse 20. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. And let me ask you something, and I'm just guessing here. I'm, just, I'm just, just freestyling here. Let me ask you, why do you think that Mary stayed at home? If you were in this situation, what, what would you do? Why wouldn't Mary rush out to see Jesus right there? What do you think that Mary was feeling in this moment, in this story? Put yourself in her shoes. I think it's safe to say that Mary was ticked. Mary was ticked off that this happened. That Jesus was late. What would you do with those types of emotions? If you were in her shoes, how would you react? What would you do with those types of mo emotions? She'd be mad. She'd think, y you could have. You should have. I would have. I would have done that. But you didn't. Has anyone ever felt like that? We gave you every opportunity. You clearly don't love us. You love strangers. We hear about it from, from, from land to land, right? You love the Romans so much. You love Gentiles. You love all of those people, but not your own people. But when Martha got there, she fell at Jesus' feet, and she says this in verse 21. Lord, and this is Martha saying to Jesus, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. She went to Jesus, but do not be mistaken. Martha is at the feet of Jesus saying that this is your fault. This is your doing. If you would have been there, he wouldn't have died. She put the blame squarely on Jesus Christ. And check this out in 21 and 22. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And listen to Jesus' response. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answers, because Martha thinks that Jesus is just getting preachy, right? He's just getting theological. And she says, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. You know, I know, I know. He's in a better place. I'll see him again, right? This is so dramatic. Jesus Christ looks her square in the eye and says something only a crazy person would say. Says something that maybe an imposter would say. Or says something maybe the Son of God would say. He looks at her 
He looks at this angry, confused, emotional woman who loved her brother so much and, 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 and who thought she knew who Jesus was. And he says to her, what, he says to her what I think he says to you and that he says to me on a, perhaps a daily basis. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. You think resurrection is an event, and it is. You think resurrection is about the future, and it is. But Martha, I am. I am the resurrection. And Martha, I am the life. In John 25, and 26, verses 25 and 26. Anyone who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he asks her a question that would mean different people or different things to different people at different stages of, the, of their life. He, w- he asks here a question that was maybe easy to believe when we were six. That we might have been able to believe super simple when we were 12. But when we got to or get to 25, it becomes a little bit more difficult to believe. When we get to that age, it becomes a little bit more difficult when we're watching someone we love suffer. It becomes more difficult when you just went through like the most difficult period of your life. And you felt like you were in that storm. But Jesus looks her in the eye and he asks this question. Do you believe this? Martha, do you believe this? Even with all that you've just experienced, knowing that I could have kept this from happening, Do you still trust me? Do you still believe that I am who you thought I was? Even though I haven't acted like you thought I should act based on who you thought I was. Do you believe this? And she says, yes. She says, yes, Lord. She told him, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into this world. And then, then Martha runs back and says to Mary that you have to go see the master before he gets into town. And John describes, after Mary runs out there and basically has this same conversation with Jesus, your fault, I know, Your fault, I know, but do you still believe? Asking the questions of why didn't you show up? Because they believe he could have stopped this. John describes that Jesus' reaction in her emotion. And this is powerful. In verse 33, it says, When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her were also weeping, that he was moved in spirit and troubled. And so then he asks this question. He asks all of them, where have you laid him? Come and see, Lord, they replied. And here's, here's where John records for us something that just, that's just totally amazing. He records this thing for us that helps us to understand that when we're going through the most difficult periods in our lives, when we're struggling, and again, that thread of a thread, we're just hanging on, even if God could have, would have, should have, but didn't, we start to see it's not because he's distant. God has the ability to enter into our deepest pain, even if he doesn't do anything about it. I believe that's, when, that's why he put that he was so troubled in spirit. God can enter into our deepest pain, even if he chooses 
not to do anything about it. And Jesus paused, knowing what, exactly what's about to transpire. He knows exactly how this story was going to play out and how this story would end. But I think for your sake and for my sake, John says this in verse 35. Jesus wept. The King of kings, the Son of God, our Lord and Savior, wept. And it's, it's as if he's saying here that, 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 that Jesus, coming from Jesus, I'm not too big to understand. I'm not so unapproachable and disconnected to not understand. I'm not too distant. I'm not too almighty to understand that when you suffer, when you hurt, and when you don't understand, and when you feel abandoned by God, it's as if God leans into our world and he whispers, I know. I know what you're going through. I haven't given you more than you could handle. I'm still here. I need you to hold on. I know that it hurts. I know that you're scared. And John, continuing in 35 and 37, Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And even he is standing outside this tomb. Jesus, mourning the loss of his friend. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? In other words, why didn't he do something about that? Jesus once more, deeply moved, came to the tomb. And it was this cave with a stone laid across the entrance. And he says, take away the stone. And they weren't expecting this. They were already confused, right? Because Lazarus was dead. He's completely dead. He's already dead. Lazarus is gone. And Jesus says that I want you to remove the stone. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been dead. And I want, I want you to, to think about this. As she finishes this sentence, this is that pushing the knife in and twisting it. That's this, this is your fault that, that he says, for he has, she says, he has been there for four days. You didn't show up right after the funeral. He's been gone four days. It's not like we just put him in there. We put him in there four days ago. He's been in the tomb for four days. And I love this part. Jesus said to her, and I think, he, again, he says this to you and he says this to me. And in fact, I know he's always saying this to me in verse 40. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? That is, if you trust me, that is, if you place your weight on me, did I not tell you that if you believe that, that, that you will see, right there, there's that word again, you will see the glory of God. And Mary is thinking, uh, um, okay, seriously, this whole thing is about you? My brother's dead. This whole thing is about your glory? This whole thing is about whether or not we believe? This whole thing is about, about whether we can trust you when that thing that we think that you should have changed, doesn't get changed. This is all about you. That's what this whole thing is about. In other words, you let your friend die so that we would learn some sort of lesson about your glory. And he says, I told you, if you keep your eyes open, if you continue to trust me, if you continue to believe, if you continue to put that one foot in front of the other, one step after the next... If you continue to, to, to live your life as if I am exactly who I say I am, then you will catch a glimpse, a glimpse of the glory, of my glory. 
even in your most difficult time. And the text continues in verse 41. So they took away the stone. And then Jesus looked up and said, and I love this part too, because because this is what he says before reaching the prayer part. Jesus basically has this prayer going on with God, right? He's saying, okay, God, they're watching. They're expecting big things. I'm just talking to you so that they don't focus on me because I want them to know who you are. I want them to understand our connection. So we're just going to talk a little bit. How are you doing? I think it's been enough. Okay, okay. I, I want them to see me talking so that when this thing happens, I don't want any of these people here to be like, whoop, whoop, Jesus. I want all of these people to say, whoop, whoop, God, that we just saw the glory of God and we saw the Son of God being used in this mighty, mighty way. He just wanted them to reflect. He wanted this situation to reflect God's power. Jesus wanted this to be all about God in this big, big way. And so here we go. They've seen Jesus praying to God. In 41, it continued, Father, I thank you that you heard me. And in 42, it says, I know that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the other people standing there. That they may believe that you sent me. This situation is about me, but it's only about me so that they see you. And so Jesus is telling us that this was worth all of the drama. It was worth all of the pain, all of the emotion. And it was just for the people to understand this connection with God. And he thinks it's worth that. And the text continues in 43. It says, when... He had said this. Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Probably didn't sound like Bob Barker. Come on down. You know, Price is your next. Anyway, bad joke. Let Lazarus, back to Lazarus. In 44, the dead man came out. His hands and his feet were wrapped in strips of linen and cloth around his face, right? Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Why did Jesus have to say, take off the grave clothes and let him go? Because nobody was moving. They were all freaked out. This guy walks out like the mummy, right? He's sitting there and he's like, take that stuff off. He's going to fall, bust his face. I got to do another miracle. Jesus is coming out. These people are weirded out. They're freaked out. This is not what they expected. This man just shouted in and woke the dead. This is, this is an, an understatement here that, that in 1145, therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary had seen what Jesus did and put their faith in him. How would you react there in that moment? They saw this. He knew they would see this. He knew how this story would unfold. And right there, all of these people put their faith in him. And I'm saying, I bet they did. That would have been freaky. I bet everybody in their town put their faith in him right there in that moment because that story had to spread like wildfire. Lazarus was a popular guy. Everybody knew who Lazarus was. You know, he didn't just heal. He actually raised them from the dead. He didn't wake somebody up who might have been asleep. Maybe someone who passed out, right? Got into that communal wine, right? He didn't, he didn't just wake somebody out, someone that they couldn't find a pulse, but he was really there. He raised someone from the tomb after four days. This right here showed that there was nothing, nothing, nothing that he couldn't do. So here's the question. Why doesn't God do something about that? And the answer is, we don't know sometimes. But here's what we do know. Because of that, because of that day in Bethany with Jesus and and some of the people that he loved, we know three things. We know that he can, sometimes he waits, 
But we can trust him in the meantime. And so why doesn't God do something about that? And I'm going to tell you the honest answer is I don't know. But I know he can. I know that sometimes he waits. I know that, that, that we can trust him in the meantime. And I know that I can trust him in the meantime because he made me a promise. He made all of you a promise. In in 1140, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. If you believe, if you continue to trust, if you continue to maintain hope, if you maintain focus, even in the midst of the worst of the worst, God is able to leverage that in our lives. God is able to leverage that for his glory and for the glory of his son. And if you continue to trust him, even when God is inattentive, If you look outside your circumstances and and the things that God is doing outside of your world, just like we talked about with John the Baptist, when God is uncooperative, if you lean into his grace, because Paul told us last week, Paul told us that his grace, God's grace, was sufficient for you, sufficient for me, even in those circumstances, even if, It never changes. And when you feel like God is late, when you're looking for his glory, if you believe, you will absolutely, eventually, see the glory of your Heavenly Father. On my way here today, I had something laid on my heart. I don't know if that makes any sense. I know most of you are just impressed that I have a baseball up here. (laughs) Because I don't know how to play. (laughs) But I shot a message to my brother Dan. And I asked him if he could bring a baseball. And what I pictured was if I... And so many of you were on that little league team. And whether it's whether it's God softly lobbing those situations in our lives, not giving us more than we can handle, or whether he says, You can't even take that, so we're gonna set it on the tee so that you can not feel stressed out. When we hit that ball. And we're caught up in the moment, caught up, caught up in the feeling of how awesome we are. And we hit that ball and we start running. God is sitting there patiently. Because just like you've inevitably seen in a little league game. We are so high on ourselves that when we crack that ball, we're so excited. Many times, we run the wrong way. And our Heavenly Father is so excited, He doesn't even try to stop us. He might whisper, hey, psst, you're running the wrong way. You're getting a little caught up there, Scooter. This way. This way, it's not the end of the world. It's not the last game. It's surely not the last ball that you're going to hit. You do need to understand that the enemy, the devil, Lucifer himself, will sit there in the stands happy that you're running the wrong way because he doesn't want you to run the right way. The devil is working against you. He's actually cheering for you when you mess up. I heard somebody say in one of their talks yesterday, when when you are doing wrong, the devil doesn't pay any attention to you because he's happy that you're doing wrong. He's happy that your focus is off of God. He's happy that you're so enveloped in your own greatness. 
and he's perfectly happy when you run the wrong way. We need to practice more. We need to practice more so that we don't view ourselves as so great. We need to practice more so that in the excitement, we have the habits, the skills, the tendencies to run the right way. We need to practice more and spend more time in His Word in a relationship with Him. Because every single one of you has the ability to hit that grand slam. Every single one of you were given these gifts in your life to hit that grand slam. Can we pray? We are so blessed. But like those kids... We focus on all the wrong things. We focus on the shiny things. We focus on the hurdles of life. We need to get busy counting the blessings that he's given us. We need to start adding these things up. We need to count them up. Count up the blessings that he's given you. That sun keeps shining on us no matter what. We are given so much, yet we are like Adam. We're like Adam. That, 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 that We become victims of Lucifer's lies. But in stepped Jesus. In stepped Jesus. We were all, every single one of us, created to lead. But we needed someone to lead us more than a teacher he brought us back from the darkness Jesus Christ redeemed you and the least we can do is give the most of ourselves the least we can do is think about our faith with excellence it does not matter what you did yesterday I don't care what you did two years ago I don't care what you did this morning the least we can do is give more of ourselves, the most of ourselves. That's the way it's supposed to be. We need to be more and more like Him. That is the way it's supposed to be. Heavenly Father, walls are coming down. I feel it. People are stepping out. I see it. People are talking about you. I hear it. I hear wonderful things, amazing things. People stepping into that light of your glory, believing that all things are possible in you, that nothing is possible, nothing is possible aside and apart from you. I see the, the victories in the lives of the people here. I see the victories in the lives of the people that I meet. And I want to start focusing on that. And Lord God, I ask that you give us, that you give us the heart that all of us can focus on those victories so that your kingdom can be glorified. Amen.